In November of 2018, the World Federation of Therapeutic Communities decided to have its 2019 board meeting in Thessaloniki, Greece, in conjunction with the European Federation of Therapeutic Communities biannual conference. The World Federation also wanted to host a training institute and asked Naya Arbiter, Rowdy Yates, Kathleen Yates, and Rod Mullen to be trainers for the two-day institute under the auspices of Aristotle University of Thessaloniki. The institute was held on September 17th and 18th with 60 participants from across Europe, the Middle East, and Australia. The focus of the institute was for participants to have a better understanding of the therapeutic community modality from several perspectives. This series of edited videos captures some of the training provided and some of the interactions of the participants with the trainers. Rod Mullen, President, Amity Foundation, USA. Rod Mullen began his career in the therapeutic community in 1967 with Synanon Foundation. He joined his partner, Naya Arbiter, at Amity Foundation in 1982 and served as the Chief Executive Officer through 2018. He now serves as President of the Amity Foundation and a member of the Executive Council, where he is focusing on leadership development and the issues inherent in maintaining the essence of community in a large, multi-site organization spanning two states and a variety of services. During his career, he has developed and implemented TCs with adolescents, women and children, Native Americans, and men and women under criminal justice supervision, both those incarcerated and those in community-based settings. He has been a consultant to many organizations in the U.S. and several other countries. He has had articles published in professional journals and books and has been an invited speaker to many national and international conferences. Prior to his career, he graduated from the University of California, Berkeley, where he participated in civil rights and anti-war demonstrations and was arrested in the free speech movement. First, I want to uh, encourage you all, uh, if you haven't, for, for those who are kind of new to this, George DeLeon, George DeLeon wrote a book called The Red Book, kind of very famous in therapeutic communities, which is theory, model, and method. Uh, if you haven't read that, it's really valuable. But we also made a videotape, a three-hour videotape of George explaining uh, what are the basics of therapeutic communities. And you can, you can get that. Uh, just go YouTube, Amity Foundation USA, the Therapeutic Community Training Series, and you'll find this three-hour session of DeLeon kind of giving you an easier way than reading the 400-page book, you know. Uh, and very useful, I think, for, for understanding uh, therapeutic communities. So we're going to kind of come at this kind of a slightly different direction uh, than the normal one, which is all the elements. But I think you'll find it interesting. OK, so. There's a lot of ways of describing therapeutic communities. Uh, and they've, it's been described many, many different ways. Funding sources have their own particular, what, what are we paying you to do? So habilitation, of course, rehabilitation is returning somebody to a state they were at before, where they were functioning. But most of the people we get in therapeutic communities never function very well. So we're really involved in habilitation rather than rehabilitation. We're trying to get people to a place where they do function, not where they were before. Treatment, education, another way of looking at it is welfare to work. You know, that's a, a, a valid way of looking at it. Uh, reducing recidivism, which when we're dealing with criminal justice populations, they want to know that people who go through the the correctional therapeutic community are doing better than people who didn't have that experience, which is legitimate. Life skills, mental health, uh, 
personal responsibility education. A lot of people, uh, victim awareness is really good. You know, people have some actual empathy for the people that they've harmed. So those are all different ways of describing what TCs do and why they're valuable. So, <clears throat> but fundamentally we can say in therapeutic communities, we're in the growth business. You know, people should grow and change as a result. Uh, I, when I talk to people, I say to our new people, I say, none of you want to stay the way you are. That's why you're here. We all kind of agree on that, you know. So, <clears throat> how do people grow and change? Uh, there are kind of processes for growth and change that we're all, all familiar with uh, from just our own life experience. So let's look at cognitive growth for a minute. This is from Piaget, uh, basically his theories, which most of you probably ran into when you're in college. So we know that, that children go through these kind of well-defined stages. And each stage is pretty different from the stage below it. Uh, there's a great example if you take an infant and all of you have probably done this or seen this at one point or another. You take a, a ball and the infant's following the ball and it disappears behind a box. When it comes out the other end, the infant goes like this. They didn't expect it, right? But if you do it a year later, if it doesn't come out, they're surprised because they now have integrated that cognitive function of even though I can't see it, it's still there, right? So these stages of cognitive development are, are pretty well known and, and we all have our own personal experience of growing up and we also have the experience of, of our children or nephews and nieces and whatever. Just quickly, uh, cognitive stages are qualitative, qualitatively different. It just doesn't mean you added knowledge. You actually are processing information differently at each stage. The stages are invariant. You can't start at the top and work your way down. You have to start at the bottom and work your way up. Uh, and each stage is a hierarchical integration in the sense of Every upper stage understands the lower stage, but no lower stage understands the upper stage. So it's this invariant sequence that we go through. And then the interesting thing about these stages is they're really cross-cultural. You know, when, when Piaget did his work uh, and then started looking around the world, really found that these stages are pretty much universal. So that gives us some then, then along came uh, a guy out of Harvard by the name of Lawrence Kohlberg. How many of you have heard of Lawrence Kohlberg? Okay, a few. Okay, so he had been basically, one of the last uh, works that Piaget did was called uh, The Moral Judgment of the Child. And he got interested, well, okay, we have this cognitive stuff, but how do people learn morality? And he was looking at how kids develop rules and games and things like that. Uh, you know, the constant refrain, that's not fair, is a moral judgment, and children develop that. Uh, so he began to think, to take that work and say, okay, how do people develop morally? It's a different kind than just cognitive in, in intelligence and growth. And of course, one of his students, Carol Gilligan, uh, criticized his work because he says, Women think differently than guys. They're not as hierarchical. They're much more interested in relationships and much more motivated by relationships than they are by king of the mountain kind of thinking, okay? And, uh, and we, <laughs> we, we agree with that, but we still think that both, mostly Kohlberg's work is pretty relevant, particularly relevant for us thinking about therapeutic communities. So we all start at zero, so there's no bad or good uh, you know, uh, in terms of being at zero. That's just kind of where you start. But we 
do expect as we grow as human beings that we are going to get more sophisticated in terms of our behavior. So what is charming in a uh, one-year-old is not charming in a 30-year-old. Okay, so we, we have that to think about. And at each stage, we kind of ask, is the person kind of age appropriate? What's the age appropriate behavior at that particular stage? So let's take a look. Stage zero is pre-moral. There is no understanding of rules. This is, this is the original hippie stage. If it feels good, do it, right? Okay, so your infant uh, does not say, well, I really shouldn't take a dump in my diapers. It's just kind of like that's what's happening now, and there's no judgment about that, right? And we don't have any judgment about it. So then we get to stage one, which is really goodness or badness is kind of determined about whether I'm rewarded or punished, okay? Uh, if I'm not punished, uh, uh, then it's probably okay. Uh, and of course, what do we see? Let's take this for a moment into adult behaviors, okay? What happens when we have a big hurricane or a disaster? The stage one people start looting, right? They weren't looting before, why? Because they were gonna get punished. But as soon as, <laughs> as, soon as uh, the disaster strikes, Stage one says, cool, I'm not going to get punished. Let's go and get a few television sets or whatever else is kind of lying around. Okay? So that's kind of the translation into what looks fine for a uh, four or five year old is really socially pretty unacceptable at 30 or 40 or 20. Stage two, instrumental hedonist. Uh, this is basically the marketplace mentality. We have a president who's really right in this stage, you know. If he can, you know, the art of the deal, you know, I mean, he has absolutely no moral compass whatsoever. It's strictly about whether I can get over uh, and, and get what I want, and the consequences to others is of no uh, concern of his, okay? So we have a, 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 a wonderful, or a terrible example of what this looks like in, in, in an adult. For a kid, you'll see two kids in a playground, for example, and a little boy might see uh, uh, another little boy who has an, something he wants and go over and try and, uh, uh, before hitting him on the head and just taking it, which would be kind of the stage one, he would try and make a deal, like I will give you my sand bucket for your fire truck, knowing that the fire truck is a much more valuable object, but if I can get away with it, it works, okay? So this is kind of the marketplace mentality, which again is charming at age five or six, a lot, lot less charming as, as folks get older, and we have an awful lot of people in our society who are definitely in this stage. Stage three, good boy, uh, nice girl orientation. And we all know, for those of you who have children, there's a wonderful stage, it doesn't last long <laughs> enough, when your kids will do anything for your approval, you know, just to be with you, okay? The girls wanna be mom's helper, and you know, the boys wanna take the trash out, and then teenage years hit, and that's all gone. But we have fond memories of it, okay? Uh, what does that look like in, and this is the Boy Scouts, Girl Scouts, that kind of thing is, is really, that stage of behavior really, really fits really well. What does it look like in, uh, in, in adults? Well, uh, we have, uh, again, in my country, we have uh, the Republican Senate, which are all being good boys, uh, supporting Mr. Trump as he does wrecks our society, okay? but they want to be good boys and good girls, okay? We had a great example of it. What did, what did the Nazis call uh, Hitler? The father, okay? So you really have this good boy, good girl orientation in adult behavior, which is no judgment, no moral compass. It's simply if my dad or the father or the leader says it's good, then it's good. 
and I want to be good for that person. Okay? Pretty dangerous uh, in our society. Stage four is kind of where we hope most people get to in our societies, at least, which is a law and order orientation, uh, you know, which is pretty conventional. What, what, what has been the law is, should always be the law. It isn't particularly a creative stage or one that's very malleable, but it is at least one where people want to drive on the, the side of the road if they uh, see a, a wallet lying on the, on the ground, they try and find the owner rather than saying, it's my lucky day, you know. So this kind of more conventional behavior uh, is really what we would call the bedrock of most societies. That's what the glue that holds them together is a very large proportion of people who really are law and order oriented, okay. So if you want, just for a, a moment, having done a lot of work with gangs, adolescent gangs and adult gangs, if you take a look at stage three, if somebody's moving into the hierarchy of a gang, and remember, a lot of gangs serve a real purpose. They maybe serve the purpose of creating some sanctuary or some community in an urban area. They may serve the purpose of helping uh, in, in, our, in California some of the new refugees who are really at sea and nobody wants them, so they start <coughs> sort of gangs. So, you know, the stage three, when you watch people moving into a gang at their early stages, they, you can really always see this behavior. I want to be part of this group, so I will be the lookout. I want to be part of this group, so I will go get food. So you can take this and you can apply it not only to little kids, but you can take it, particularly if you work in prisons or you work with people that have been in prison, um, it's this, I found this very useful to teach it and then have people articulate, our men and women that have done a lot of time, their process in terms of moral development, in terms of how they became bonded and where they got stuck. <coughs> See what I mean? And then, you know, they go off to college and they call up and they say, God, they're doing that TC stuff in, in the university. And I'll say, well, what are you doing? Well, we're doing Colbert. I said, well, actually, that started in the university. <laughs> but, you know, but it, it gives people some confidence and some context to think about their own lives in a slightly different way. Why did we take uh, men who had been sentenced to life for murder? Okay, you don't get sentenced to life for jaywalking. Uh, so they were all people who had committed murders and make them the core group. Well, because we're using the good boy phenomenon, okay? We, those guys made it safe. Okay, well, they're doing it, then I guess I can do it. They were following them in the wrong path. When we flip those guys around, those really strong alpha guys, all of a sudden they followed them right into the TC and, and moral behavior. Okay, stage five. And stage five is really uh, a, a very familiar stage, I would uh, presume for all of us in this room, this is really constitutional democracy. You know, this is, we, we respect the laws, but we also know that we have to change the laws, you know, as society changes, okay? Uh, and so this is really basically the social contract, so to speak. Our agreement that yes, you can govern for us as long as you, we can vote for you and vote, get rid of you, okay? Uh, that the laws are there, but they're not immutable. They're not carved in, in rock. They can change as society changes, okay? So, so the goodness is really defined by individual rights and standards that have the agreement of society, and they're based on what we hope is rational discussion uh, and not YouTube, or not to Facebook. Okay, and then uh, the final stage, stage six, which is uh, fairly rare, but one we're all familiar with. These are our moral heroes. These are the Jesus, the Gandhi, the, you know, wh whoever fits your paragon of virtue. Uh, these are people who really don't see a difference between themselves and the world and are willing to make personal dramatic personal sacrifices 
very frequently, like Martin Luther King or many of these other people, sacrifice their own life in the process of a higher goal for humanity. Okay? And again, these folks are very rare, but they are, in fact, our inspiration uh, for, for doing better. Okay, so that's basically what Kohlberg said. Okay, this is, these are these stages, and he did a whole series of, developed a whole series of tests to figure out where people were at, kind of clever little tests that people would take, and you know, uh, <clears throat> the, 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 the classic test was your uh, wife is dying of a, of a rare disease, the drugstore has a uh, prescription, that if you can get it for her, uh, you can, uh, it would save her life, but you don't have the money, so what do you do? Well, uh, you know, it's stage one, there's no question, <laughs> you just run in, break the windows in the store. I mean, then there's a point, the law and order folks, you know, you can't break the law, even if it's, even if it's a question of, uh, you know, the saving your wife's life. So you have all these different, how, the, how people look at that particular dilemma helps define where they are, what stage they're, they're, they're at, okay? The key thing in this is that cognitive or intellectual development is necessary but not sufficient for moral <laughs> growth. And we've seen a lot of examples of that uh, uh, obviously, I don't think Trump is stupid, but I mean, morally, he's flatlined, okay? Uh, Dick Nixon was a great example, again, in our country, I'm using examples in our country, but there's plenty around the world, of somebody who was very, very smart, but again, was a, a, a criminal, you know, basically. Uh, <clears throat> so we know that simply having great cognitive ability does not automatically confer moral growth and a moral compass. Yes? One of the things that's fun within a therapeutic community is to teach people the last hundred years or so, pick your favorites, of Nobel Peace Prize winners. Because the Nobel Peace Prize winners are an international group. Um, they're men and women. Now, you know, since Malala, there's, you know, these wide range of ages and Typically, they're people that are bo both have intellectual intelligence, but they also have a real moral compass. And they're role models for the world. So a lot of times, you know, I'll, I'll um, you know, have different people as assignments for seminars, just find a Nobel Peace Prize winner, and then they'll teach that. That'll be a seminar subject within the community because it's such an integrated group, and people are also then learning about the history of the world, they're learning about conflicts, they're learning about genocides, they're learning about uh, the environment with Wangira because she was, you know, one in Africa, she won all of those, uh, the, the prize for right. planting, you know, thousands of trees. So it, it, the Nobel Peace Prize sort of captures the issues of our time embodied with a person who's tried to do something about it as a global role model. So we know that somebody who, who's got a 60 IQ is going to be pretty limited in terms of moral uh, uh, growth as well. I mean, you have to have a certain, you know, I think you have to have at least a, kind of an average cognitive processing piece of equipment on your shoulders to, to really grow morally. But as we said, you can have a very, very superior piece of equipment and not grow morally. So really, let's look at, at TCs. Let's say at least 95% of the people in our therapeutic communities, they got the equipment for moral growth. It isn't like we're, we're, we're dealing with a, a, an entire, you know, with, with a group of people that are cognitively challenged. Many times the, the fact that they don't look really, really smart is the conditions they've been in and the messages that they've received. And once they get in, in a learning environment where they're encouraged you know, bang, you all of a sudden see these enormous bursts. One of the things that George uh, did years ago, George de Leon, saw in therapeutic communities a 10 to 15 point change in IQ in the course of somebody being in a therapeutic community. Now, did their IQ change? No. 
you know, you know, but the environment stimulated them so that they tested differently. Okay. So what are the conditions for moral development? That's really our, really our key question. If people are capable of moral growth, and that's what we really want. We want people who are coming in at stage two and three to get out of this very, very self-centered, selfish uh, kind of uh, mindset and behavior into something else. So a simple way of looking at, at this uh, is people move from being takers to givers. Okay? Really, their orientation is different. And this is practiced every day. Roddy was talking about it earlier. You know, you get a big brother or a big, big sister immediately. So you're immediately responsible for somebody else's life. You're constantly encouraged to meet, to engage, to accept other people, okay? Uh, and to work with them cooperatively. So immediately these things really begin to, to change. And a way of diagramming that kind of looks like this. If we looked at that entire pre-conventional level, what's really important? Okay. Okay, in the pre-conventional level, I'm about the whole thing, everything in the world, other than, you know, who's feeding me, is, is uh, about me, right? Uh, as we get into this conventional uh, uh, order, you know, that law and order mentality, I recognize that there's other people in the world and I have to kind of work out relationships with them, okay? And then finally, when we get to the post-conventional level, I recognize that the meaning in my life is not how much I get, but how much I give, okay? That the real sustenance in my life, the joy in my life is not how much I got, but how much I made a difference in other people's lives, okay? And actually, you guys are all pretty good examples of that. That's why you're here, that's why you're involved in therapeutic communities, that's why you're interested in therapeutic communities, is because the most important thing in your life is, can I make a difference? Can I help other people? Okay? And that's where we really want to get our students, our participants, to move through these stages and get to that stage. So what are the conditions for moral growth? And, and these are conditions, and this is almost like a little checklist. If you have these on a three by five card and you go to any TC, pull them out and see if they're happening. If they're happening, you've got a really robust, vibrant therapeutic community, okay? So it's a real key fit in terms of what Rowdy is saying, what George is saying, some of the descriptions of therapeutic communities. It's just like a nice little lock, you know, and another kind of avenue at looking at therapeutic communities. So what are the conditions? Credible role models, okay. We always want to have people in therapeutic communities who have been there, done that, right? We always want to have recovering people. We want to have people who have been on the streets. We want to have people who've been in jail, who have committed crimes, who have done uh, awful things in their lives, but have changed. They, ha they are the people who are the evidence of the vitality and the, and the credibility of the therapeutic community because you can't deny a medical miracle, okay? It's there, it's talking to you. And you know immediately when that person said, if I can do it, you can do it, that that is credible. In many cases, the PhD is not credible because the person says, you don't know anything about my life. You've never been on the streets. You've never been arrested. You've never, you, you've never walked in my shoes, okay? So we want... And that doesn't mean they, that, that academically trained people don't have a significant role to play in the therapeutic community. But for people, when they're coming in the front door, they want to meet people who are credible to them. Okay? Teachers who teach one level above. It's a great farming expression. Don't put the hay so high the horse can't get it. Okay? And we have some teachers 
who want to wax eloquent about how brilliant they are. Okay, <laughs> they almost footnote their comments. They're not very good for the therapeutic community because they're not meeting people where they're at. You have to meet them. You have to understand what level is this person at and what is a, how is a way I can talk to that person that makes sense to them. I'll give me an example. This is a, a guy who turned out to be a wonderful man. But as a newcomer into our therapeutic community, he had a decision to make. He had been called by the prosecutors to admit to a crime that he had done with another man. Okay? And he wasn't going to get prosecuted for it, but they wanted to have his testimony on the record for this guy who was already going to go to prison. So this was kind of gratuitous. However, if he refused to testify, he would go to prison as well. Okay? So I had a dilemma. <laughs> How do I talk to Fernando about this, this dilemma? Like, because for him, I don't, I'm not a snitch. Okay? Totally identified with his good boy, good girl, level three, with those, that set of norms. You never snitch, no matter what. So I pose the dilemma this way. Are you going to snitch on your friend who's already gone, or are you going to snitch on your daughter? Because if you, if you don't snitch on your friend, your daughter lo lo loses her father, who she needs. That was a great dilemma for him. I mean, he gnashed his teeth. You know, I mean, the equivalent of rolling on the floor. I mean, he was very unhappy with that dilemma. But that was the dilemma that he needed, okay? Put in a context that, that he could understand, okay? It wasn't like the theory of parenthood, you know, which would not have gone over very well, or your responsibilities and so forth. No, it was like, okay, you're gonna, if you're going to snitch, who are you going to snitch on? The daughter or the guy who's already gone anyhow, okay? And he decided that he would testify, okay? So again, when we're teaching in the therapeutic community, the first thing is like, where's that person at? What argument can they hear? And one of the reasons that TCs are so great is because your peers are more likely, because they're a month or two months or maybe a year ahead of you, to, to really assess where you are and to give you some information that you can hear really well. It's important to recognize that there are two elements within that one level above, okay? Firstly, for people who are many levels above, it's learning how to communicate right. at one level right. above. Secondly, for people who are just one level above, that's a fairly uncomfortable place to be. Um, trust me, I've done this with students when I worked in the university and you were one day ahead right. with your lecture notes. It's anxiety making. It's much better if you are just one level ahead, it's really good to have someone who above you who's two levels ahead and above them three levels ahead. So it's, it's about your place in that arena. A lot of times you'll say to somebody when we do our community interviews, well, yeah, how can we help you? Why do you want to come here? And a lot of times the reasons aren't reasons that we are all, where we are in our own lives, comfortable. Because I've worked almost always in border states. My day-to-day -day job is been, I worked in Texas, I worked in Arizona, I worked in California. So I'm always kind of around that Mexican border. So we may have many people that come over the last 30 years and they say, well, I need, I need to stop using drugs. And we'll say, well, okay, or I need to stop using alcohol, or I need to reduce my violence, whatever. Um, because then I'll be a better drug dealer if I'm not using the merchandise, and if I'm not out beating people up. And my reason for coming is, you know, I, I, I'll make more money 
if I can figure out how to get a hold of this, this addiction or you know, get out of my gang membership. And that's okay for the first step. And I've had, you know, sometimes somebody will come in and say, well, wait a minute, that's not, you know, that's not moral, it's not this. But if they have a, the first reason is the first step that they can stand on, that's fine. And then they'll be pulled up to a different level of the staircase. Now, as you remember, the first seminar on the pull-up in 1959, the way it was taught is it was basically just a stairway. And the idea was, you know, I'm, uh, you, know you're, you know something I don't know, so you say, Naya, I'm going to pull you up to this level of knowledge about that. And I would say, thank you. And you would say, it's a life worth saving, and I would say, thank you. You see what I mean? It was a responsive. But pull-ups were just stairs. We're going to keep pulling each other up. So with moral development, somebody comes in, and their, their reason for what they may be wanting to do may sound off balance for somebody doing the interview, but as long as they have a reason that's a starting point, you have something to work with. And if that's their idea of self-help is I'm going to be a better drug dealer, you know, that's a starting point, and in two weeks it'll change. Zev, Zev Putterman, who was uh, one of the first guys in, in Synanon, this is way back in the probably late 50s, so he calls up uh, uh, Reed Kimball, who was uh, one of the directors, and said, uh, "I, I, I want to come to Synanon, but you know, can I use on the weekend?" <laughs> what was the right answer? We'll talk about it when you get here. <laughs> okay. A lot of the people in this prison project <laughs> were, uh, "Why do you want to come in to to the TC?" Well, because if I don't come into the TC. I'm going to get transferred right. to another prison, and my girlfriend won't be able to visit because it's too far away. Come on in, <laughs> okay? <laughs> so we're not looking for high moral ground at the beginning of this. We, st we start at zero and, and work our way up. Okay, uh, so conflict. The example I told you with Fernando is a great example of a conflict. Now, some con uh, we, we want meaningful conflict, not meaningless conflict. Uh, a conflict which essentially produces a dilemma which is liable to create growth is what we're looking for. And these abound in the therapeutic community. I mean, it's, it's a target-rich environment for, for, for moral dilemmas, uh, you know, of all kinds of, of, of positive uh, dilemmas that force people to recognize because when you have this kind of a dilemma what begins to happen is the recognition is that the way I'm thinking isn't working <laughs> okay and this is a sounds very simple it is really profound for someone to realize the way I've been thinking about this just doesn't make seem to make the kind of sense it did when I was on the streets, okay? The way I think about women, for example, you know, uh, as kind of utilitarian objects that I can fasten onto, extract what I need, and move on. Uh, people begin to learn, guys, that's not, that's not really healthy, you know? Now that I'm really getting connected to these women, now that I'm listening to their stories, okay? Naya did a wonderful thing one time. We did this retreat, and at the end of the retreat, she had the women get up, and they had all written letters about their stories. Hard for them to read their own letter, so we, they traded off, so one woman would read another woman's story. And this was in front of the entire community. And these stories were raw. I mean, I'm talking about painful to listen to you know, rapes, child abuse, uh, you know, abandonment, uh, you know, just, just the entire uh, panoply of disasters that you could imagine. And so they read these stories and, and then we had kind of a forum where the guys were talking about it and they were just like, whoa, I've never heard this before. I've never understood what the, the pain that these women suffer. 
And it was very, very powerful. It was a dilemma, but it was a very creative dilemma. And that's essentially what happens in therapeutic communities, which does not happen in a clinical setting. It just doesn't happen because it's not set up that way for that kind of really rich growth experience. Okay, many roles to play. Well, why is that important? Empathy is being able to put yourself in someone else's shoes, right? To be able to identify with them. To be able to feel their pain and to feel their joy, their sadness. To really begin to, uh, to, to read their emotions. <clears throat> if you don't have many roles to play and you get sort of solidified in one role, you really don't understand someone else's role. So uh, for, for your children growing up, it's so important. What is play behavior all about? It's about all this role development, you know? Okay, I'll be the horse, you be the cowboy. You know, okay, now, now it's my turn. You know, I mean, there's, on that simplistic level, there's all this kind of exchange of roles going on and understanding, you know, when someone else cries, like you can see kids at a certain stage uh, in, in, in some of these stages, another kid cries, it's no big deal, you know, in me, you know. And then the next stage, there's like tremendous desire to comfort, to inquire what's going on. Uh, and Part of moral growth is empathy. Really developing this ability to role reverse and understand, to sympathize and to feel other people's feelings, uh, to listen to them sympathetically. And what do we do? These wonderful things we call encounter groups are an opportunity every week, sometimes every day, to listen to feedback about you and for you to give feedback about others. It's an empathy engine. You know, it's an engine of understanding, appreciating, if they're done correctly. Now, you know, groups can be done in a very negative way, too, where they really uh, make people, uh, they, they reproduce some of their most negative experiences. And that's our job in the therapeutic community, to make sure that encounters are used for their highest and best purpose. Which doesn't mean there isn't yelling and hollering and expressions of anger, but that fundamentally these are opportunities for people to understand themselves and to understand others. Okay, and <clears throat> sustained responsibility for the welfare of another. We talk about, so like, uh, you know, when I grew up as a kid on a farm, first thing as a little kid, some of you have had this experience, you had animals to take care of, okay? And you, you learned very, very quickly uh, how to, that, that you were responsible for treating that animal in a protective way, to never, never miss a feeding, to always worry about them, are they okay? you know, to notice if they were sick or not doing well. One of the real, one of the real losses in urban environments is kids don't have those experiences. You know, they don't have those opportunities to take care of, 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 of someone else uh, in that way, another living being, and to take that responsibility. But certainly in the therapeutic community, immediately, Immediately, as soon as people come in, people come in and say, okay, you're gonna be a big, bro you're gonna take care of so-and-so. Well, I've only been here a week. Yeah, you know, a week more than that guy, right? Okay, so we're constantly insisting and demanding that people take care of other people. And we really make that point. What you do makes a difference in that person's life. So you're, you're constantly being reminded and of course, what's the greatest uh, obstacle for somebody who's addicted to overcome? Denial, 
denial that really, because the, 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 the mantra is, well, it's my life, I'm destroying it, so what? It's mine. And what we learn in the therapeutic community is, yeah, it's your life, but man, does it have an effect on so many people. And when we get in the therapeutic community, you're constantly getting feedback. Hey, what you did made me mad, made me sad, hurt my feelings. You know, I was counting on you, right? So this constant reinforcement of, yeah, it's your life, but it's our life too. And we, we, are, in, we are dependent upon one another, okay? So you're constantly getting that very, very moral message, which is forcing you up through these stages. And what's really amazing, what's really amazing, given the fact that our length of stay are fairly short, and, and too short in most cases, that we actually move people through usually two or three of these stages during the course of their time in a therapeutic community. That's the amazing thing. Think about growth. We all know something about growth because we all started this and we're larger now. Okay. So we know something about physical growth in, in the world. We watch trees grow, we watch ourselves grow, and our children grow, and our grandchildren grow, and so forth and so on. So we're pretty familiar with that concept. We don't even really talk about it much. We're all more or less aware of cognitive growth because we see that, you know, we know teenagers think differently than, than we do, at least at this point in our lives. We know that these stages that I was talking about earlier, cognitive change, these rather dramatic changes that occur in a fairly short period of time in a child's life, uh, we're all familiar with that we're less familiar with talking about moral growth, even though it's so important. You know? We don't talk that much about it. We tend to talk about it in a very static way, you know, like somebody's just, you know, doesn't have it, or somebody is kind of, st we, we talk about it as if people are sort of stuck <coughs> at a level as a, 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 in adulthood, and that they don't really change that much. But in fact, we have 60 years of evidence that in therapeutic communities, people's stages of moral growth are accelerated dramatically. Okay? And that these are not just temporary changes. These are changes that tend to persist. When people get to a, a level of four and five, they don't typically, it doesn't have to, you know, I mean, it isn't like they won't speed in their cars ever, okay? Which is not, I consider, a huge moral failing. But most of the behaviors that we associate with level two and level three thinking never recur. You know? That once people understand and get to that level where they really understand even when they've left the immediate intentional community, because that's what therapeutic communities are. It's an intentional community which is designed to do exactly this, to promote growth. That when they leave the intentional community, they understand they're part of a community wherever they live. Okay? And that those behaviors that they learned in the therapeutic community are universally applicable. Okay? Pretty remarkable. Pretty remarkable. And we don't talk about it enough. We don't talk enough about the magic and the miracle that occurs in an intentional community. To take people who have largely been written off by society as failures, as misfits, uh, and to see their lives change in such a dramatic fashion a few years ago, I did an interview. Uh, this is again available called, called TC Pioneers. And I was fortunate enough to get a, a group of about, I don't know, I think it was about eight or nine people who had all been involved in therapeutic communities in the United States kind of pretty early to the inception. 
and that included George de Leon and Lou Yablonsky and David Deitch and some other people. And the thing that was common in all these people who experienced the therapeutic community for the first time is, and that most of them, many of them were professional people, said, I never believed, I never would have imagined that it was not just symptom removal, but people's lives changed dramatically. They were different people. And that's the power of what we do when we do it well. And we don't always do it well. But when we do it well, it is truly miraculous and dramatic. So TC is an intentional community. It happens by design. We design it for one purpose, and the purpose is for growing, for growth. So when it's properly implemented, we get all these conditions for moral growth. They just occur. You know, they're kind of baked in to the, to the design of the therapeutic community. And you can see it in terms of if people have criminal tendencies, you see pretty dramatic reductions. Uh, if people are, are, are not criminal, but still you see really dramatic changes in terms of their pro-social behavior. Here we are, Aristotle University. We might as well quote Aristotle, right? <laughs> okay. The man outside the polis is a god or a beast. So we become human in community. Okay. Uh, some of you may have read at some point there were some studies done uh, back in the 18th century about wolf children. Uh, before we were so highly urbanized, there were occasionally, not very many of them, but children who would stray off into the woods, of course most of them died, but some of them were actually adopted by wolves. And then the question when they were rediscovered uh, they weren't very good wolves, by the way, but, you know. But when they were rediscovered, it was how do you get them to be human beings? And the answer was you didn't. Uh, they had missed these critical points of socialization uh, in their lives, and they literally could never really, uh, they might be able to speak a few words, but they were always uh, uh, pretty outside the pale of what we considered to be humanity. So what does that mean? It means our genes give us the capacity to be human, but community gives us the socialization to be human. And without that so socialization, we don't really develop our fullest human characteristics. And in some ways, we can look at the TC as like, we're an we're, it's an incubator for moral growth, one way of saying it. Okay? Most of the people who fund us would think this conversation is, what the hell are they talking about? You know, where's the statistics, you know, right? How does this fit into my narrow little bureaucratic paradigm? And it really doesn't, because the TC really doesn't. It's much larger than most of the people who fund us really ever understand. But it's important that we understand it so that we can be loyal to it. And this is something I think it's really important that we tend tends to get lost. The need to be needed uh, is such an important quality uh, of therapeutic communities, which again, most of our funders do not understand at all. But we need to understand it, that this engine gets started when people feel that they are needed and wanted, and they have a role to play in the community. And there's a wonderful book by Sebastian Junger who wrote this book called Tribe, and he said, the beauty and the tragedy of the modern world is that it eliminates situations that require people to demonstrate a commitment to the collective good. Literally, we can go through our modern, fairly insulated lives for many of us without ever, ever having to make a personal sacrifice for the benefit of another person. And those sacrifices that we make 
for the benefit of other people, that's what grows us up. That's what matures us. That's what makes us moral people and not just entities living on the planet trying to get as much as we can, ignoring others. So the TC does that. As soon as you come in, it's, you know, you're needed. Well, wait a minute, I just got here. You know, you're still needed, okay? Uh, and, and immediately people are put to work physically, which is what Roddy was saying earlier, that physical work is so important to make a physical contribution because sometimes it's the only contribution you can make for a while, then to learn how to make an emotional contribution to the community and, and to, to come from that place of being a taker to a giver, to develop that generosity of spirit, which is really what we're all about. Does anyone know what Umuganda is? Okay. Umuganda. And I'm may well be saying it incorrectly. We all know that in April of 1994, one of the worst genocides occurred in Rwanda. And the world really did not participate and particularly help. The world sat by and was a spectator. And some 800,000 people were macheted to death. And Back before, you know, there was colonization, there was a tradition of Umuganda, which is a community building, doesn't translate directly, a community building exercise. During the genocide, the word Umuganda uh, became sort of tainted. But after the genocide, uh, the government decided to try and recapture the tradition of Umuganda. Umuganda is a time of community building when everyone gathers together. This is translating right now for the last 10 years in Rwanda of the last Saturday of every month, the toll roads close, the museums close, the government closes, the stores close, and all of the citizens of Rwanda participate in Umuganda, which is they go out into their community as members and citizens of Rwanda and just clean and help each other out one day a month. So it's a community building uh, activity. And around the world at this time when we are so fractured and we've got so much isolationism and so much concern about refugees and immigrants and in the states, mass incarceration, it's useful for all of us to keep looking for those examples, whether national on the larger scale or tiny, of community building that we can adopt and somehow used to inspire us or uh, model for us. So Umuganda, it's a day where all the people that not so long ago were at such odds with, with each other go out and do something together for the greater good of their um, nation. And it is said that Rwanda is one of the cleanest and now kind of greenest in terms of sustainability countries moving along in Africa. That being said, we always ask our students in the therapeutic community to do things that they've not done before and to try things that are different. So I want to thank you all individually and collectively for just talking with each other and sharing your stories and pushing yourselves a little bit over these last few hours because it makes a difference. If we can all do that more with each other uh, as a community effort, it will translate to the circles to which we belong. So have a wonderful lunch. We're getting back together at three. And um, good luck. May you find ways to practice Umuganda in your own life.